Now, we're going back a few years. There's a funny scene in the movie Smokey and the Bandit where a weary truck driver named Snowman pulls up at a roadside cafe, and he's pulling up because he wants to get some food for the road, and he wants to make a phone call. Now, for half of you out there, I need to explain that there was a time you actually had to go to a pay phone to make a phone call because you couldn't carry your phone with you. But they did have the precursor to the phone call, the CB radio. And this whole movie is about that. He's on the phone when several tough-looking, unshaven, leather-jacketed bikers start to hassle his dog that he had brought in. You know, they're Hell's Angels type. They give him a hard time, and they claim that his dog bit them. And they're holding his dog and won't give it back. So he goes to get the dog from them, and it turns into the, to a fight. There's three or four against one. He gets beat up, and they throw him out of the diner. He limps over to his truck. He pays for his gas. He gets into the truck. And there he is at the, dry, at the steering wheel of the truck, and suddenly a smile comes onto his bloody face. And the scene ends with him driving his 18-wheeler over a line of Harleys. <laughs> and there the gas station attendant stands there with a look of admiration and goes, far out. <laughs> now, I love that scene. I absolutely love it. I love scenes in action movies where the good guy finally gets to the point where the explosions are his and they're blowing up the bad guys. And yet, since I'm up here preaching, I have to admit that that doesn't really jive with what Jesus teaches. <laughs> we're looking, to the go looking into the Gospel of Luke all year, and we're, today we're talking about the section where Jesus talks about loving your enemies. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 6. And we're going to begin at verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who or good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. We're going to take a look at what Jesus is saying. We're going to take a look at why he says it. And then we're going to take a look at one example of what that looks like in practical life. These teachings and this passage are so important that we're going to look at it twice. I'm preaching on it this week. Next week, Pastor Andy is going to take the pa this passage and a bit more and preach it again from another angle. It's that rich. We could spend a lot of time here. But let's first take a look at what Jesus is saying. First thing I need to flag is that this word love, when Jesus says it, it's a very practical word. He's not just talking about emotions. He's talking about a practical way of living with people. So, it begins with a statement, love your enemies. And near the end of the passage, in verse 35, he says it again, love your enemies. 
And then between these two commands to love your enemies, Jesus gives all kinds of details about what that looks like. Now, Pastor Andy will cover some of those details next week, but I'll cover a bit of it as well. What Jesus is teaching here stands at the, lo- at the end of a long tradition of teaching in the Bible about revenge. And so when Jesus calls us to love his enemies in this passage, the very first description of what that looks like has to do with how we handle revenge. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. He's giving a new pattern in situations where normally we would face revenge. In the Bible, we have a long string of changing ideas about how to handle revenge. And these teachings fall into roughly four categories. Unlimited revenge, limited revenge, limited love, and unlimited love. We're going to take a look at those. First, unlimited revenge. In the earliest chapters of the book of Genesis, we have a picture of unlimited revenge. This is what life was like. It's in the words of an ancient man named Lamech. It comes in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis, and it begins at verse 23, and we'll see it on the screen. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech is avenged 77 times. It's a picture of unlimited revenge. A man injured Lamech, and so he kills him. He boasts about this reputation retribution and the retribution around his life. It's not going to be sevenfold, but 77-fold. The modern version of this is, cross me on this, and I will ruin your life. Then the law is given to Moses. And when the law is given, the law limits this concept of revenge. So this is the second category, limited revenge. So in Leviticus chapter 24, we have this. Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. Anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same way. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. Now, man, I don't like reading stuff like that, but I've got to remember the context. They're living in a world of unlimited revenge. And so the law is trying to say that justice means you can't exceed the injury you've received but it's still a very rough way to live. We see this in a modern version in trade negotiations. If you raise your tariffs, we'll raise ours. Limited retribution. The third category is limited love. We're called to love in this way of thinking, but we believe that the obligation only extends so far. Jesus alludes to this sort of teaching in Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, love your your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, that's the common teaching in Jesus' time that we are supposed to love people close to us, that we have an obligation to them, but there's no obligation to do that with strangers. Modern version of this would be a family member steals from you the first time to... support a drug habit. You still keep them in your home and you try to work with them and get them help. But if it was one of their friends, you would not only kick them out of your house, even if it was just the first time, you'd make sure they were put in jail. That's this concept of limited love. 
But Jesus pushes into an entirely new category here. A category of unlimited love. We're, we're called to show love even to people who oppose us, even people who don't respect us, even people who do mean things to us. Now, I don't want to say that this teaches us you should take unlimited abuse from a spouse or a family member. We have a right for self-protection, and sometimes we need the force of law to keep people in check. But nevertheless, Jesus, what Jesus is teaching here is intended to shape the basic way we approach to life. We approach life. And there's plenty, plenty of situations when we should live this way, and yet we find it very difficult to do so. We're going to take a look at what that might look like in a practical situation in a moment. But I first want to explore why. Why does Jesus even encourage us to live this way? What's he going after? The most important reason we need to live this way comes at the end of this passage in verses 35 and 36. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. We are called to live this way because this is what God is like. It's the main reason we're called to live th this way. God sends rain and sunshine and refreshing breezes on the wicked and on the righteous, on those who love him and those who don't. Most importantly, this character of God is what's behind the entire story of redemption. While we were still rebels and enemies, Christ died for us. The entire story of Christianity flows through this singular point that God loves even his enemies. He loves them enough to die for them. He loves them enough to die for them so that they can be forgiven and ultimately released from the powers that make them enemies. We don't need any additional reason, but I'll give you one more. We're called to live this way because this will make us happier and healthier. God has made us to be like him. When we move too far away from living like that, it begins to take a toll on us. Let's think about physical body. We don't have fur, so when things get cold, we can't roam around without warm clothes on. A bear is made differently. It can handle that without a parka. When it comes to the spiritual life, we are called to be like God. We're not created to live healthily with revenge in our hearts. We are not made that way. It's intrinsically impossible. So nursing anger and hatred can have deep emotional impacts on us. It wears us out. It unsettles our judgment. It confuses the issues for us, encourages us to make bad decisions. Hatred and revenge are also the vital ingredients in fueling embarrassing outbursts that happen in our lives. As anger gets a grip, we explode. And then very often after that explosion, we have guilt and shame and even depression. And all along in that sort of lifestyle, there's a churn of stomach acid. There's sleepless nights. There's inner outrage that's always ready to overflow. 
And when we're in that state, I'm going to tell you a secret. You probably have never thought of this before. When we are in that state, we're not the most enjoyable people to be around. It affects the people around us. And those who can will take a step back to get some distance. And so this sort of lifestyle also can lead to isolation because of our bitterness. And yet, for so many, for, and for all of us often, this is human life as we know it. And it's the result of hating those who hate us and keeping that hatred in our hearts. So Jesus calls us to a pattern of life that lives without hatred and revenge. It calls us to a life of active love because that makes us more like God and it ultimately makes us happier and healthier. It's for us. So what does this way of living looks like, look like? I'm going to give you an example from my own life, from family life with Debbie and I and my broader family. I want you to know up front that I'm giving you an, a, 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 a story where I think we did the right thing. But I don't want you to think that every story I could tell you has us doing the right thing. Okay? I'm just giving you a good example. You've probably, in relationship, lived with me through bad examples. Came up early in our marriage. We're newly married, and Debbie discovered what I already knew. I was part of a family that had all kinds of unhealthy power plays going on. There were the good guys and the bad guys, so-called. And to stay in the good graces of my grandmother and my mother, you had to pick sides. You had to show loyalty. You had to agree with them, even if what they thought was unreasonable and untrue. Now, I had learned to, to deal with that in an unhealthy way. Yeah, I see that. I agree. Yeah. Mm hmm and then I'd go into a new situation, and I'd switch sides if necessary. I was a chameleon. Would hide what I really thought, which was, these people are all crazy. Let me out. <laughs> but it's the way I learned to survive. And we've got to understand that, that sometimes we learn ways that are unhealthy just to survive. But Debbie was healthier than I was, and the day came when we together realized that these lies and these tests couldn't be, couldn't be lived into. And so when these lies and these tests of loyalty came, she and I stood up and said, no, we're not going to play this game. We love you, but we don't agree with you. Now, in a healthy family, this would have just been a rough patch. But as I said, mine wasn't a healthy family. And so, my mother's response to that kind of stance on a fairly unimportant set of issues was to set herself up as Debbie's enemy. She began to lie to us. She began to leave us out of family gatherings and pretend that somehow we missed the invitations. Oh, I'm so sorry. We sent it out with mail's problems, you know, and tried to call. We were bad-mouthed, misrepresented, and excluded. And this is from all kinds of family gatherings. On top of it, we were made to feel guilty when we didn't show up. These things we weren't invited to. <laughs> so what did we do in response? Debbie and I made the decision together that we would love our enemies. That we would not treat my mother any differently than if things were going well. We remembered all the birthdays and holidays. We were polite. We were respectful. 
We were even warm when it was possible. We showed hospitality. And when we saw that my mom was in a vulnerable place and that she was going to head into financial difficulties, we could tell, and she wasn't teachable. Debbie and I started to save money. Now, we were on IB staff. We're not making big bucks. We started to save money for her financial crisis that we knew was coming. When that crisis came, we started to share with her the money that we had saved. It was our belief that if we did what Jesus said was right to do, that it would have great impact in the long run in our relationship with her. And we knew that in the short run, it would give us peace. Verse 31. We treated her as we would want to be treated. In the long run, it did have an impact. Ultimately, all the people that were playing her games either died or rejected her. And soon, we were part of a very small group that was still standing. And the day came that my mother saw that we loved her through all those years. And even though she couldn't bring herself to apologize to Debbie directly, she apologized to me to tell Debbie. Apologized for the way she had treated her for all these years. Now things are so much better now. My mom's quite old. It's far from perfect though, and and there's the regret of all those critical years when our kids could have gotten to know her better, and those years can't be reclaimed. But God's way worked for us. And it worked for her. That's the way it is when we obey God. It might be hard. It might feel unjust. It might look like we're powerless. But hear this. If we do the will of God, we are anything but powerless. Think of the cross. At the moment that sin looks like it has won, it becomes the very moment where sin is disarmed. Evil is, has its power ripped away and an entire new future for the universe begins. If we're doing the will of God, we are anything but powerless. So, let's hear the scripture again. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful.